and I just hope God uses it, meets with us in, in a special way, each one of us. Uh, often I find out when I'm preaching the Word of God, it hits me uh, right in the same places that, that it's supposed to hit other people, that it speaks to me too, and uh, a lot of the times that there's things in my life uh, that God's trying to reveal to me, just even through studying the messages. Uh, so I, I pray that He'll use this message tonight. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. It'll take just a little while to get to the, uh, the text that we're going to be uh, talking about tonight. But in 2 Samuel chapter 5, uh, the word of God says, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in times past, when Saul was king over us, thou was he that le- uh, led us out, of, uh, out and brought us brought us thus in Israel, and the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. And all the elders of Israel came to the king, uh, to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before uh, the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years, and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. All right, King David is now anointed for the third time. The first time is when Samuel uh, anointed uh, the man of God, and, and you can find that in 1 Samuel 16, 13. Uh, the second time he was anointed, that was by the tribe of Judah in 2 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Uh, so this is the third time he's now becoming the, the king of uh, of the nation of Israel. Well, over 300,000 uh, uh, men of war and tribes came to swear allegiance to David. I'd say he's uh, pretty much on, on a high note right here. Uh, there were a great period of, of three days of rejoicing uh, and feasting of the celebration of their king. Uh, they now had a godly king that was going to sit on the throne. Uh, David would have great victories for God. Uh, David would do great things for God. And uh, he actually was promised the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16, that's when the Davidic covenant was given to David. Uh, and, and the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 16, And thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall also be established forever, uh, period. That's the prophecy, uh, that, or that's the promise that God had given David right there. And that prophecy, that promise uh, will never be broken. That's the Davidic covenant as we know it. And this prophecy shall be fulfilled, when the, when, fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. So a couple things about this Davidic covenant. Uh, first of all, it is an eternal uh, for the promise of God never to break his covenant with David. All right, He'll never break this covenant with David. Also, uh, the covenant is literal for God's promises will never alter this covenant. So where are you going with this preacher? What, what are you saying all this for? Uh, this means that the Davidic covenant cannot be uh, allegorized or spiritualized away into some vague promise to the church which supposedly replaces Israel, which it does not. Uh, There are some false teachers and false preachers out there that claim to be new independent fundamental Baptists, and they're not. They're a bunch of heretics that preach false things. The church does not replace Israel, period. Israel is God's people. The church is uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ with the sole purpose, twofold, to glorify God in everything that we do and to win the lost. That's what the church is here for. Uh, so we don't replace the nation of Israel, and I can name names, but you need to stop watching people on the YouTube. Uh, you need to watch, stop watching preachers that preach false things, uh, that are trying to draw disciples after their own, their own selves, and have, have arrested the hearts and attention of a lot of our young people. Stay off that YouTube, and if you want to watch any YouTube uh, p- preacher or pastor, you go to Pastor Savage and ask him, is this approved, is this okay? Because I don't just want to be uh, uh, all these many masters in every wind of doctrine out there, so be very careful what you listen to. Uh, David has more military victories for God, uh, but all of a sudden something happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, turn over there with me, if you will, 2 Sa- Samuel chapter 11. Uh, this is going to be a thread throughout the message Uh, But what happens with David, and I'll put it like this, he stops participating in the battles. All right, and and, and 2 Samuel chapter 11, And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, uh, and they destroyed the the children of Amnon, and besieged Rabob, but David tarried there still in Jerusalem. 
So he stopped participating in the battles, and all of a sudden, bad things start happening. All right, this message is going to be about missing out on the blessings of God. I want you to see something in, in, in chapter 12. Uh, this is after he committed the, the, the sin with Bathsheba, after he had Uriah killed. Uh, all these things that happened in verse 7, uh, and, Nathan, and Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives unto thy bosom, and I gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah, and if that had not been too little, I would have moreover have given, thee, given unto thee such and such things. Look at it right there. He says, if that would not have been enough, I am the God of eternity, and if you'd have just asked me, I would have given you such and such things. But no, you despise the commandment of the Lord. You despise the blessings of God, and you go about to do your own thing because you get lured by not participating in the battles. All of a sudden, lust enters into your heart. Then you see something because you lust after then wicked imaginations. Then all of a sudden, you covet, you commit adultery, and all these curses are now going to be upon you because of these decisions of not participating in the battle. And this is a side note for us, Christian. We are in a battle. We are not in some playground. This is not some recreation room. We are in a battle. And the moment that you stop participating in the battles, that's when we're very vulnerable for all these lusts and enticements and all these sins that come into our, in our lives. And do not be deceived. You will miss so many blessings of God. Opposite, you will have the curses of God upon you. There's no reason that we should miss out on the blessings of God. Our God is, to, is an enable to uh, grant everything that we ask and we think above, uh, above even what we ask and th- what we think. But that's contingent on us being obedient to our God. And we're not obedient to God to follow His will and His word. The curse of God will reside upon us, just like it did David. Uh, David here, uh, when, when, when this happened... Um, Look, look at verse 9. This is what happened. It says, Wherefore, thou hast despised the commandment of the Lord to do, uh, to do evil in his sight. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite uh, with the sword, and thou hast uh, taken his wife to be thy wife, and slain him with the sword of the children of Amnon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. All right, so we, ha- we have now the, the curse upon David that's going to happen because he decided to stop participating in the battles. Uh, turn with me to Deuteronomy 11, uh, 26 through 28. Uh, you need to mark this in your Bible. You need, to, you need to print this out. This needs to be memory verses hanging on your doorpost. You need to make sure that you have this uh, in your heart. Uh, Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. I believe it is on the board here. Uh, we see here, or will be, behold... I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after others, other gods which you have not known. So we have it on the table there. God says, I, I set before you a blessing and a curse. A blessing, a blessing if you'll obey me, but a curse if you will not. And this is going to go in every aspect of our Christian life, friend. He's setting before us a blessing and a curse. Uh, don't miss out on the blessings of God. What blessings of God have we missed out because we did not pay attention to the word of God, did not pay attention to the things around us? Uh, we sing a song, and I'll give you that song later, but the song is, uh, There Shall Be Showers of Blessing. And in, in that chorus, it says, Mercy drops are falling all around us. Uh, we're seeing them, but because of our disobedience, that's all we're getting is mercy drops. But what are we pleading for? The shower's a blessing to fall upon us for people just to get saved all over the place, all over uh, Jackson, Jackson County, all over this world for people to come to know Christ as personal Savior, for the church to, to be able to be victorious over the, uh, the sin, o- over the flesh, the devil in this world. But what happens is when we, when we wallow in sin and we live in sin, then that's not going to be possible. David, beca- he stopped participating in the, uh, the battles. He became idle. Please be careful of idleness in your life. You be careful of idleness, and especially during this pandemic, that's all it's been is idleness. Uh, there's been reports of all the pornography going on the rise, all this uh, Netflix and people watching wicked things on the, on the TV, uh, on the video games, all this other stuff, because they're sitting at home with idle time, and that's a very dangerous time uh, in all of our lives. Uh, we need to be very careful. So this idleness... 
uh, is the devil's workshop, and it causes David to lust, to covet, to commit adultery, wicked imaginations, murder. Uh, and God says again, if, if that had been too little what I've given you, I've given you such and such things. So what happens to David's life? Bathsheba's baby, the baby ends up dying. His daughter, Tamar, ends up being raped. Why? All because he stopped participating in the battles. His daughter got raped because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. His daughter got raped. Because he was not participating, because now he had the curse of God on him, some bad things started happening in his life, and it's not God's fault, this is David's fault. Uh, one of his sons will be murdered. Uh, another son uh, will rebel and try to steal the kingdom, and he also will be killed. And it did not have to be this way. It did not have to be this way. David could have received the blessings of God by doing right. Uh, God would have given him such and such things. I want to transition this to uh, look at three testimonies of blessings where we miss out. Uh, first of all, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8, I'll give a synopsis of this, uh, of, of this chapter. Uh, but when, when, when God was not wanted as Lord, uh, a King, and authority. When God was not wanted as Lord, King, and authority... The people now wanted a king to rule over them. They were tired of God ruling over them. They no longer wanted God as their Lord. They no, no longer wanted Him as their authority. They wanted to do the things that were right in their own eyes. They wanted to have a king just like the world had a, 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 a king. And so uh, some bad things start happening to the nation of Israel. Um, we see here over in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge, judges over Israel. Verse 3. And his sons walked not in his ways, but turned aside uh, after lucre and took bribes and perverted judge, judgments. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge over us like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel, and he took it to the Lord. So what did they say? First of all, Samuel's too old. He would have been about 65 or 70 years old right now, and that's not too old. That, that's where the man of God's in his prime. That's when his hair turns gray, and he's just preaching the word of God, right? That, he's, he wasn't too old right here. That was just an excuse for them to do what they wanted to do. Uh, also, uh, Samuel's sons were evil. That was their excuse to want a king over them. Well, your, your sons are not doing right. Well, here's the, the, the failure on Israel's part, is they didn't pray for God to provide them with a godly leader. All, right, all they want to do now is what, what's right in their own eyes. Uh, they wanted to be like all the other nations. That's Israel's failure to separate from the world. They wanted to be like the world and not separate from the world. And they wanted a king to fight for, him, for them. And that's Israel's failure to trust God to fight their battles. I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't want Donald Trump fighting my spiritual battles. I don't want Nancy Pelosi or, or Joe, Sleepy Joe or any of those people fighting my spiritual battles. I want the God of heaven fighting my spiritual battles. And that's contingent on me being obedient to him for him to fight my battles for me. I don't, I'm not trusting in the political parties of this day to fight my spiritual battles for me. It just ain't going to happen. And if you're doing that, you, it will fail you. It will let you down. The government, listen, uh, the government will never fulfill your needs. Never. Yes, we are thankful for the government. It is an, a divine institution. There's three institutions that God's given us, uh, the family, the church, and the government. Praise God for that. Uh, but we're not going to trust in the government because, by the way, the government has been hijacked, if you haven't figured that out yet. It's not a righteous government. Nonetheless, uh, what God tells them now is, is okay, you're going to get this king, and he's going to steal your daughters, he's going to steal your sons, he's going to take your fields, your wine presses, he's going to take your, your, your servants, uh, he's going to do all this and, and turn over uh, to verse 18 and look. After all this, they cry to have an a, a, a earthly uh, man rule over them, not God. And he says that he gives all the warning from verse 11, 13, 14, 15. Gives all the warning what's going to happen when this man takes over. And he says, and you shall cry out that day because your king, which he shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. You want to miss out on the blessing of God? Stop making him the authority in your life. We'll get to that in just a second, but uh, what happens in, in our own nation? You know, our nation no longer fears God. Um, even in Hollywood, they used to have the, the, the demons scared of the cross. That, they'll, they'll take that, and, and, and they're, this world does not fear God whatsoever. There's no fear of God before their eyes. 
there's no fear of God because of the things that they do. Uh, they still murder a million babies a year. You know, the, safe, the un, most unsafe place in this country to be is not in the project, not in Baltimore, not in these places, Oregon and Seattle, where they're having the riot, riots. The most unsafe place in this country is in a mother's womb. There's something wrong with that. If the most unsafe place in a free nation is in mama's belly, there's a problem. Over a million babies a year are murdered in this country. And since, most, since I've been alive, it's been legal in this country. You tell me that God's going to bless that? God is not going to bless that. What about all the immorality that abounds? All the, all the immorality that, that's out there. What about all the abominations of these lifestyles, of the homosexual, the transgender, and all this, uh, this crazy thinking in these people's minds? You think that God is going to bless that? When a nation turns its back on a, a holy and righteous God, you think God is going to bless that? No, our country is not being blessed right now if you haven't figured that out. Uh, we did have a space of grace for a little while, but the church stayed asleep. I don't know how many more people ra rose up to go out soul winning to win the lost. And by the way, let me just say this on, 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 on that, that one topic. I think a, a lot of people uh, get hung up on that. You know what Jesus said uh, in, in, in Mark chapter 16? He says, go ye into all the world and do what? Preach what? Okay, what is the gospel? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what is the gospel? Death, burial, and resurrection. How hard is that? He did not say go into all the world and give your soul winning plan. He did not say go into all the world and be most knowledgeable to answer every single Bible question that you may have thrown at you. No, he says go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Do I like shallow gospel presentations? No, I don't. I try to be as thorough as I possibly can because I'm not there just to get a person to say a prayer. I do not write names in my Bible. I do not take notches for people to take Christ as Savior, but I am commanded to go give the gospel. You know, someone is disgruntled with me and they don't want to uh, talk to me. They're going to slam the door. Uh, that's fine, but before they do, let me just tell you one thing. The Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, rose from the dead, and if you'll trust Him as your Savior, He'll give you eternal life. I just did what? I shared the gospel with them. Don't be afraid to share the gospel. If you have not done that in some time, it's time to raise up as a church to do that. Uh, just last week, uh, we, we knocked on a door. We've now started knocking on doors, I think, two weeks ago. I knocked on my first door in six months, and it was like a breath of fresh air. Finally, not, well, I rang one of those electronic doorbells and, and had to, anyway, it's a whole different thing now. But I, I was able to talk to somebody. But Saturday, uh, a man with long hair down to the past his shoulders and with those gauges, yellow gauges in his ear, I had woke the guy up on top of everything. Uh, he comes out and he has this burly look to him, and I'm thinking, man, this guy looks pretty rough. But you know what? I'm here to, for one mission, to give the gospel. And so I have both my son, and I don't know why we did this, but they're, his name's Michael and his name's Jackson. So I have to tell this guy that Michael Jackson is with me <laughs> at this door, okay? Uh, but he wakes up, and the, and, and the look of this guy, his name was... Uh, Hagen, Lovell, uh, we're still praying for Hagen that he'll come to church, live stream last week, uh, but he was ready, he had been seeking God, I asked the question, may I take about 10 or 15 minutes and tell you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven, and I took the wonderful gospel message and told him about his sin, the penalty of sin, and Hagen, in his own words, bowed that long hair of his and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save his soul Forgive his sins, take him to heaven when he died. Why? Because we were faithful to go out and get the gospel to him. Uh, we need to be able to share the gospel with people. But this country has gone nuts. We went to Wayback Burger. There's, it's, it's a place. I don't know if y'all have that here. Well, you probably do on Van Drive. Y'all have everything on Van Drive. I'm sure y'all got a Wayback Burger on there somewhere. But if you do, don't go to that place. Um, the internet, whatever, I'm protesting that place. We went in there, and on, on their menu, they had a pride shake. They wanted to have... Uh, for uh, the homosexuals, they had a milkshake you could buy that had the different colors. Had I not already placed my order, buddy, I would have been out of that door. Um, but nonetheless, we're not going to go back. And I've, uh, anytime I, I had a chance to preach, I'm, I'm saying don't go to that place. They support uh, what's an abomination to God, and we're not going to have anything to do with that. 
Uh, what about the drugs and alcohol that flow in this land? Making it legal now. Uh, prescription drugs too, you've got to watch out for that. But Psalm 9, 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom hath chosen uh, for his own inheritance. But let's be real, this country is missing out, missing out on the blessings of God. Not only that, but we have the fear of this, this, fear of this coronavirus. I don't, I don't uh, take it lightly. Uh, just like I don't take the flu lightly. I don't take pneumonia lightly. None of that stuff. But I'll remind you that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Yes, we can be cautious and intelligent, but we do not have to be scared. You know, a lot of people aren't knocking doors right now because of the COVID pandemic. That's not a good excuse. A mask on six feet. Matter of fact, you know, when I stand six feet from this door, the most amazing thing starts happening. These people come out and shut the door behind themselves. And we have a little bit more time with them to talk. People are aching to talk to folks right now. Um, but we have people that are scared of this virus and they're not doing anything for God because of it. Yes, we have to have wisdom. I understand all that. But then you have all the chaos and the rioting, uh, the defunding, the police officers. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, anyone that wants to defund the police officer, I will not support. Uh, any of these businesses support any of that. I'm not going to support. Why? Because the police officers are God ministers. They do not yield the sword in vain. They execute uh, judgment upon the evildoers. God has established those. Whether they're good or bad, God has ordained those police officers for our protection. Uh, and I'm not defunding any of those, but this place has gone nuts. Uh, the mayor in Chicago was pleading for Walmart and other ret retailers uh, not to abandon their city after the rioting and the police uh, was uh, forces to get defunded. I'm sorry, but if you're going to defund the police and I'm a business owner, I'm getting out of there. I'm not going to have anything to do with that. So that's our nation. That's the, the place that we're in. But what about Christendom in a whole? Have we, stopped, have we wanted uh, someone else to rule over us and not have God? And I would say, yes, that's the, uh, the majority uh, have departed from the Word of God. The majority have departed from the God of the Word of God. Uh, and I'll, I'll name them off. The Southern Baptist Church, the non-denominational, the sequel friendly. Uh, the churches are out of order right now. We can drive down a, a, across this road and you can see them with their big parking lots and their big buildings. I can guarantee you they're not thundering out the Word of God. And so we have a problem there because uh, what we're commanded to worship God in is spirit and in truth. And if we're not worshiping him in truth and spirit we're not worshiping god at all and i'm sorry but the church is not to be a, a nightclub it's not to be a, a place of of rock and roll and and a place where uh the preacher doesn't have a tie on i'm, I'm just saying that's not <laughs> that was not a hit i promise he showed me the letter it's on his desk i will show me the letter but these places are out of order they don't have they 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 don't dress that nice. They'll, they'll wear the, the, the turtlenecks and the polos. Uh, they, go, they go as far away from the man of God as they possibly can and teach a bunch of lies and fallacies, and they have no business even being open. Don't get, don't get deceived by those places. Uh, you're not going to hear the word of God thundered out when you go to the places. You're going to get stroked and said how great you are and that you'll have a wonderful life and a wonderful day if you'll just uh, put money in the offering and uh, just pray and everything will be just fine. No. If you do not obey God, you will have God's curse on you, friend. And that's from the Word of God. And you have to come to a place where the man of God loves you enough to tell you the truth. Because if the man of God's not going to tell you the truth, I can tell you he don't love you. He loves himself. That's exactly what happens. Uh, so here, uh, Christendom as a whole, but what about us? How does this hit, hit home? All right, having another, having... Uh, someone else have authority over us. Uh, Jesus addressed this in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Uh, he says this, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Why are you going to call him your Lord and your master? You live by a faith of the word of God, faith and practice, but you just don't practice hardly any of it. That sounds good for your, uh, your thesis statement but you still have a, a grumpy spirit, you still uh, say things angrily, you still don't treat uh, others right, treat your family right. That, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? When is the last time you shared the gospel? Call him Lord and not do the things that he say? You have to be, we all have to be very careful 
uh, in our life to always examine ourselves, that we're walking with God, that we're doing the things that the Word of God says, uh, that we, we keep ourselves in check by the Word of God. Um, I have a few written down here. This is not, um, a lot of them is just what the Lord laid on my heart because of the time. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, this is the Lord Jesus. He says, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. We're facing some terrible, troubling times right now with fascist, Marxist, socialists taking over. And what are we supposed to do? Go to the gun store, get AR-15s, and load up on bullets, right? No. He says, love your enemies. We're to love the people that hate our God. We're to love the people that hate us. We're to love them with the love like Christ loved them. Is that easy to do? No, it's not. But you have to be in the spirit. You have to be walking with God in order to love your enemy as you're supposed to love your enemy. We were challenged as a staff uh, by Pastor Allison to read a book. Uh, it's called Saving My Assassin by Virginia uh, Prodan. Uh, she had the habit of praying for her persecutors. Uh, persecutors. Uh, she was asked how she handled the uh, uh, securiate, is what they were called, how she handled them so well, uh, that they were cruel. And she says, I've learned to see the securiate uh, not as cruel and heartless, but rather fragile human beings who desperately need God's love in their life. Uh, she went on to say, I decided long ago to forgive them and to pray that God who knows their heart will transfer them. Uh, transfer them. I believe uh, that this is part of God's mission for me, to love and pray for my enemies. And the blessing of this is one day an officer in an interrogation room uh, hit her so hard that her nose started to bleed. Now this lady was under 5 foot tall and 87 pounds. Um, instead of pain, she says, I felt the powerful, loving force well up within me. Without even thinking, I looked up the man and said, God loves you, and I love you too. His hand, which had been raised to strike me again, stopped in midair, and his eyes began to water. Uh, he had turned his face from me. In that moment, I caught a glimpse of the awesome power of Christ's love because Christ's love conquers everything. He was able to instill in me a love for that man that I never could felt on my own. So we're to love our enemy, friend. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? When the time comes for us uh, to have uh, the enemies knocking at our doors, and it's coming. It's, not coming, it's coming before too long, it's coming. Our job, yes, is to be wise, but we're to love those folks. Uh, we're to love them with God's love and try to reach them with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our duty while we're here on this planet to reach everyone that we can. Again, what about our families? Husbands, what about you? Nevertheless, let everyone in you so particular love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now this next point, I did not plan it, uh, preaching it here on purpose, but uh, Pastor Savage was preaching at the S.W.O.R.D. conference, uh, not the conference, but the men's conference, and he said something about Miss Debbie. Um, he was talking about relationships, and he, he was talking about this verse, loving your wife as yourself, and there was a pocket knife that he wanted uh, from the Lowe's or one of these uh, places, and he'd walked by it several times and would not buy that thing, uh, but finally he just couldn't resist anymore, so he walked over to Miss Debbie, gave her $50, and went and bought the knife for himself. Because if he was going to love himself to give himself that knife, he was going to buy her something also. Uh, this has been a good illustration in this message, but also uh, I'm not promoting the shoe other than I'm, going, I'm fixing to promote the shoe. Uh, but I, I had a pair of running shoes called Hoka's. They have heels on them or, or, or foam on them that's probably, the foam on them is like that tall. So when you're running, I mean, it feels like you're running on clouds. It's not really that tall, more like that tall. So I had got uh, someone in our church had these and... Uh, he encouraged me to buy a pair, and I did. And I went out for a jog, and I could not believe it. I didn't take very many steps, turn around. I said, well, you need to get in the car, dear. We're going to go buy you some Hoka's. Now, they're not the most attractive shoes, but they are the most comfortable shoes I've ever put on in my life. Uh, but it's, it's about loving my wife as I love myself. If I'm going to buy myself a golf club, she needs to get her a Michael's Kors purse. And the more purses she has, the happier she is. It, it just works out. Uh, it works out wonderful in our family. It really does. Just, just as I was taught by Pastor Savage. Uh, wonderful. But wives, what about you? Uh, submit yourselves unto your own husband as to the Lord. You're to submit to your husband as you submit to Jesus Christ. So when you're not submitting to your husband, 
we as husbands can just detect that you're not walking with Christ at that time. You're not surrendering or submitting to your husband as to the Lord. That's your responsibility. Behold, I set before you a curse and a blessing. A blessing if you'll obey, a curse if you will not. Uh, there's lives that hang in the, ma- uh, the balance on how we uh, interact as a mar- in, in, in our marriage. Uh, the children, what about obeying the parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That is our responsibility. That takes diligence, it takes consistency, but we're to raise up our families. This is the time more than ever that we need to be diligent in our families. I got three young people right here that I have one shot to get it right. I got one shot. He's 12 years old. Before I blink, he's going to be driving a car, and then I'll blink again. He'll be off in college. And what did I do? Did I, did, it right? did I do it right? Praying for him, trying to raise him up as consistently as I possibly can. But then after that, it's too late. They spread wings and they fly. I'm going to take God's prescription uh, that the things I teach him, he will not depart from. And I just trust that and believe that. And that's for all my children, but we have to be willing to obey uh, the Word of God in our families. What's the authority in your life? Are you missing out on the, uh, on the blessings of God? Maybe sin has become an abusive master in your life. Um, we are set free from sin, not to be enslaved by it. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, why it's called today, lest any of you be hardened, through the deceitfulness of sin, you say, well, that will never be me. Yeah, if, you're deceived, if, if you get hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, friend, you could depart from the living God, from the authority of God in your life if you let sin reign in your life. That's the warning that God gives us. What about money? It's the root of all evil, but it can be an abusive master position, power, uh, athletes, superheroes, celebrities. There is only one God that we should have total allegiance and loyalty to, And that's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. All of our allegiance should be to him and to him alone. Every single day we should look to to glorify him, to praise him, to serve him, to live for him every single day. Because if not, we're going to be missing out on the blessings of God. The next testimony I want to look at, what about the lack of faith? In 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 through 19, now Elisha, was fallen sick of his sickness thereof, thereof he died. And jo- Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha uh, said unto him, Take the bow and arrows. And he took unto him the bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians of Aphek till thou have consumed them. And he said, take the arrows. And he took them and he said unto the the king of Israel, smite unto the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria, but thrice. So of lack of unbelief and a lack of faith. And and I want to talk about continuing in prayer. Uh, Go ahead and smite that prayer altar one more time. Go ahead and and pray for that uh, lost family member, that wayward child, that spouse. Go ahead and pray for that coworker, that person to get uh, saved. Go ahead and, and not get weary in the fight of faith, the lack of faith. As, that, as the king did of not smoting that five or six times. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, verses 2 through 8, um, uh, there was a judge in the city which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward uh, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry unto him day and night? Though he bear long with them, I tell you, uh, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man uh, cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Continue in prayer. Uh, I have a lost dad. Uh, This past year I went down, um, this is before all the COVID hit, got to have a, a wonderful, God opened a wonderful opportunity for us to be in a car together. 
uh, and I get to have a wonderful witness with my dad. I'm crying, he's crying, and all he can say is, keep praying for me, son. And I pleaded with my dad, Dad, I'll pray for you till, I, till, the, till the Lord calls me home, but you have to make a decision with your free will. God, you have to make a decision to accept Christ as your Savior before it's too late, Dad. Uh, and something's just holding him up. He, he will not make that decision. So I'm just going to keep, keep on praying for Dad that he'll get saved. I'm going to keep praying that not only through my witness, but witness of other people, things that come into his life, that he'll turn to Christ. And I think uh, it's worth praying for. I think as we'll continue to pray, God will do amazing things. But we get weary in this busy life of not continuing to pray for things that we need to pray for. Fight the good fight of faith. 2 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called, excuse me, where thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. So fight the good fight, don't get weary uh, and lose faith in fighting the fights that you need to fight. goes back to participating in the battle, the spiritual battle that we're in. Keep participating every single day in that battle. Put your armor on, get busy for God. What about watching? You know, we have to be vigilant in our watch. Uh, in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that ye enter not in temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What about redeeming the time? Ephesians 5, 14 and 17. Wherefore he saith, the wake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Redeem the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of, of God is. And continue in well-doing because God will not be mocked. Again, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Again, I'll put a bless God puts a blessing and a curse before us, a blessing if we'll do the things and a curse that we won't. Uh, I had been saved about four years. This would have been 2006. I had been saved for about four years, which I was still young in my Christian life. Uh, and I met Carrie Allison. Well, when I was interested in Carrie Allison, all of a sudden somebody became interested in me. Someone named uh, Pastor Mike Allison became interested in me. All right, so here's the blessing and the curse. Had I not been fulfilling... <laughs> interested in finding out about me. Had I not been doing the things that I ought to be doing by God, I would have not had the, been the, bless, had the blessing of having her hand in marriage. I wouldn't have those three kids with me right now. Why? Because Pastor Allison called my pastor. We also had a, a friend in Jimmy Clark who had visited our church some, had visit, visited Madison Baptist Church, and Brother Clark and I had got to know each other real well. Uh, we played golf together, and you get to learn, learn somebody on the golf course, let me tell you. Um, and so we had some, some good times, uh, but he called and checked on these things. What is this guy like? Is he just a Sunday morning visitor? Is he just someone that comes Sunday morning? Uh, is he faithful? Does he go out soul winning? What does this guy do? What is his testimony? What is he about? Is he somebody that my daughter can talk to? And I can tell you right now, had I not been doing the will and word of God, I would not have the blessing of having a godly wife and a godly family right now. It just wouldn't have happened. But I was faithful to do the things of God, and God blessed that. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, I think that her sister was a little upset that Pastor didn't grill me harder. Uh, than he did. Well, he already grilled my pastor and Brother Clark. He already found out about me without asking me anything. Uh, and I praise, I praise God for uh, the family that he's given me. I, I, I do remember this as, as a, um, a newly saved man. I remember reading a verse in the Bible uh, talking about when you go to your closet and pray in secret, God will, will uh, answer thee openly. And I was too young to realize in the Lord that, that did, meant I was taking my luggage and golf clubs out of that closet I was pulling that string light, and I was closing that closet door behind me, praying, God, would you give me a wife? Would you give me a godly family? So in my Sunday school class, sometimes I tell folks that I have a closet wife, and they just kind of look at me funny. Uh, well, I got her from the closet. Uh, that's where I was praying for her, and, and God answered that prayer. Um, praise God for that, continuing in prayer. Uh, but what about when pride comes in? Uh, in James chapter 4 and verse 6, God says he giveth more grace... Wherefore he saith, God resisted the proud, uh, but giveth grace unto the humble. Turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of, of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him... 
the Lord had given de deliverance unto Cyril. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little, a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife, and she said unto her mistress. Now, th this is just so important here that we, we get this point. It doesn't matter who you are, the statue you have, you can be a witness. This little girl starts witnessing that there is a prophet that could help uh, the man that she's under right now. Uh, she said unto her mistress, would, uh, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in uh, Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Uh, and the story goes on. They go, uh, he, he gives a letter to his king. The king gives letter to the, the king of Israel. The king of Israel uh, rents his clothes, and he, he wants to try to heal this guy, but he can't. And um, Elijah, Elisha gets word of this, basically says for him to come see me. Uh, and we see here that uh, um, you can't witness to the wrong person in this, in this case, and it's ended up going to change this guy's life. Back in that book that I had read, uh, it's called Saving My Assassin, and I did give the ending of the book uh, to our church uh, because they were encouraged to read it also. Uh, the title of the book is Saving My Assassin, and I told all of them that the assassin actually gets saved. And uh, it was a quite, quite a funny thing that I, I revealed the book there uh, to everyone. So anyway, the assassin gets saved. Uh, this six foot ten uh, guy from the, uh, uh, the KGB of, the, uh, of Romania come, come to kill her, and uh, she began to witness to that guy. He ended up getting saved. Uh, afterward, I read this book. I, I, I don't think they're of our stripe, Independent Baptist, but it was just a great book. Um, and she's standing next to her, her assassin. He's six foot ten, and she's just under five foot tall. And it's a, it was an amazing story. Uh, it just talked about how communism and, and the oppression of communism. But God's grace and hand through all of that. Uh, she ended up witnessing that guy. He ended up getting saved. Uh, but now Naaman ha ha has a choice here. Uh, in verse 9, he finally goes to Elisha. So Naaman came, to, uh, came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy, thy flesh shall come to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman didn't like that. Uh, but Naaman was wroth. He went away and said, Behold, I thought uh, he may surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord. Uh, his God and strike his hand or some play. He wanted some faith healing, uh, some, some big show when, when Elisha just sent his service, servant out. Uh, so he's going he's gonna to leave in his pride uh, because there's better rivers where he comes from. Why do I have to dip in this dirty Jordan? Uh, so he's going to leave in his pride. He's also going to leave in his leprosy. All because he didn't want to do what the man of God uh, told him to do. Uh, but look, uh, verse 13, we also have an, another servant that speaks up. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, uh, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not had done it? How much rather than, uh, than when he saith unto thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, uh, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And said, Behold, now I know that there is uh, no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. This man finally humbled himself and went and dipped in the Jordan seven times. And all of a sudden his leprosy is, is healed. God's, God's way is the only way. Not just the best way, but it's the only way. And if he had just listened. Uh, there's a similar story about, about how simple it is to humble yourself. About how simple it is even to get saved. Over in the book of John chapter 3 and verse 14... Uh, the Bible says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Uh, and the nation of Israel, they began to, to, to complain and cry against God. God sent fiery serpents to bite them. I don't know about you, but I do not like snakes. I don't want no snake biting me. I don't want no snake around me. But these snakes are biting these people, and they're having these poisonous bites. They're dying uh, left and right. They're crying out to God uh, to, to save them. Uh, so God tells Moses, I want you to lift up a brazen serpent, a brass serpent. I want you to put that on the pole. And I don't know how many of the millions of the people and how high that pole had to be for all them to see that brass serpent. God says, if you'll just look at that brazen serpent, then you will live. But if you don't, you will die. And I can just only imagine some stubborn 
a Jewish man in a tent that said, that's just too easy. I'm not going to do that. I, there has to be something else. Someone can suck maybe the poison out of my leg or do something, but that's just too simple. And he died in that poisonous snake bite when all he did was have to humble himself, come out that tent, look at that brass serpent, he would have been completely healed. And that's the same thing with salvation. The rest of that verse, in verse or the next verse says, um, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, um, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The simplicity of salvation. But what happens when we don't humble ourselves, when there's pride in our life, then we don't get the blessings of God. God's way is the only way that matters for salvation. But what about service also? Uh, I'm going I'm to close with this. Turn with me to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Missing out on the blessings of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss out on, on any blessings from God. And He's just not going to bless us to bless us, friend. But this is David's cry after he committed that sin with Bathsheba, had, had uh, Uriah killed. This was David's cry about God having mercy on him. He called this sin what it was, according to thy loving kindness, according unto thy multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly. For my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin ever before me. He goes on in verse 10 and says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But look at verse 12. Uh, he says in verse 12, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. All right, sin had been in his life. He's asking now for his, his, his salvation to be afresh. I don't know about if you remember, but when you first got saved, how on fire for God that you were. There wasn't nobody going to shut you up from sharing the gospel or to telling or uh, preaching against sin or just, I mean, you're so excited about your salvation because you had joy in that salvation. But let me remind you, friend, if you were a born again believer, let me remind you, listen to me very clearly. You're not going to hell when you die. That's worth enough to serve him. If you're a born again believer, you're not going to hell when you die. You're going to have uh, heaven as your home. God being your God, restore the joy of my salvation. Why? Look what happens when it does. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, when my, the joy of my salvation is restored, then will I teach transgressor thy ways. So when my salvation is restored, the joy of my salvation is restored, all of a sudden the responsibility and duty that I had in, from the very beginning now takes precedence. I now am teaching transgressors thy ways, and sinners are being converted to thee. Why? Because you got the joy of your salvation back. Now the blessings of God begin to fall on us. Praise God for His, His, His mercy. I'm thankful for that. Um, but again, I do not want to be cursed of God because I was disobedient to the Word of God. Blessings are curses, church. Are, are you missing out on the blessings of God? Are you missing out from... Uh, serving Him. Uh, maybe it's your love and loyalty. Maybe you've started loving the things of this world. Maybe you started doing things that are right in your own eyes and have departed from the God of the Word of God. Maybe you've just conformed to, to certain standards, but you never uh, conformed to God and His standard of His Word because of what He says in His Word, the why you do what you do. Your loyalty being to the God of the Word of God. What about maybe you've gotten... Uh, weary in participating in the battle. Maybe you stop fighting the fight. Maybe you stop fighting the fight of faith or stop praying. Maybe you stop reading your Bible. Maybe you stop witnessing. What have you stopped doing that you're missing out on the blessings of God? Maybe it's pride. You don't even realize that you've missed out on the blessing of God. You don't even realize that there's sin in your life because of your pride. You know the prideful man will be the most spiritual man in here? Not really, but if you ask him, he will be. He's deceived by his own pride. He's deceived by the sin he will not see it. You have to ask God to reveal that to you, to search your heart out, and to humble yourself before Him. If not, you will miss out on the blessing of God, and it will be detrimental in your life. That song that I, I, I told you, Mercy Drops Around Us Are Falling. Uh, the song goes like this, There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. 
There shall be seasons refreshing sent from the Savior above. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. There shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come in thy honor thy word. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they might fall. Now is to God we're confessing. Now is on Jesus we call. There shall be showers of blessing if we trust and obey. There shall be uh, seasons refreshing if we let God have his way. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops around us are falling. But for the showers we plead. Father, we bow in thy presence and we do thank you for your love. We thank you for your warnings, your mercy, your message. We pray uh, that we would each take heed in our hearts from the word of God. Uh, Father, we, we seek to have your blessings fall upon us. Uh, Lord, you lay it very clear in your word, blessing or curse. Blessing if we obey, a curse if that we won't. Uh, Father, we do ask that you would please bless this church, bless this country. Uh, Lord, please revive your people to service, to loyalty, to love. And Father, we pray that you would continue uh, to use us to magnify your name, to glorify you, to win uh, the lost. Uh, Father, please do a work in each of our hearts to have a renewed love for you, to restore the, restore the joy of our salvation, that we may love and serve you as we did before. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed. <clears throat> Lord, I want to thank you for just the different areas of truth that we've heard tonight and the uh, areas that we heard this morning even about forgiveness and being prideful. And Lord, uh, I feel like that you've visited our church now, several services about winning the lost. And while we we are going out and we are hanging invitations and the gospel on people's doors. We all know people, people that live right beside us, people that are co-workers at work right beside us, people in our own family that uh, aren't saved. And uh, so clearly preached tonight was uh, the presentation of the gospel. And we're not there to answer all the problems of the worlds of COVID-19, but, but we do have the answer of salvation, and it's Jesus Christ. And I pray, dear God, that you give us a great burden for the people that we know that are lost, and that we will uh, go after that father or that mother or that brother or sister, that coworker, that neighbor, that longtime friend, that's not prepared to meet God. Well, God, I'm so grateful tonight that, that I know that I've been saved and I'm prepared to meet you. And I desperately want to hear well done thy good and faithful servant. But I think of others that I love very much and they're not prepared to meet you. Help us to have a burden and help us to, to be kind and loving but at the same time to be bold and to snatch them from the fire, as Jude says, on some having compassion, making a difference. Lord, uh, meet our needs. I pray for those who are watching live stream. Dear God, that you work in their heart. As one lady contacted me this last week and just talked about how convicted she was and, and how moved she was about uh, giving the gospel out. Lord, I pray if there be anyone that is without Christ that they would call us or if they're here present in the room tonight that they would come forward. Lord, help all of us to come tonight with that one, that, that person, or those folks that we know uh, that are without, without you. They think that their answer is going to be in a, the Oval Office. They think their answer is going to be in their particular uh, political party. They think that the answer is going to be another stimulus package, but the answer alone is Jesus Christ. You are the Savior of the world, and we, uh, we know that. Would you meet with us tonight? Would you help us to yield ourselves 
And as the book of James says, to humble ourselves before the Lord.